Hi, my name is Jonas Lett and I am the CEO of the company Flowkit at which we developed the open source CFG software Palabos. Palabos is based on a numerical model called the Lattice Boltzmann method and you are now listening to one of my recent talks in which I provide an introduction to Lattice Boltzmann. The talk shows a little bit of theory and a few typical practical applications. Without any further delay, let's get started with the typical application of CFT. That movie shows a water reservoir with an immersed pump placed inside a cylindrical tube. The blue surface represents the interface between the water and the air, and you can see how the water is projected into the air, splashes against surrounding walls, and flows back into the reservoir. If you look narrowly, you can even observe the initial lowering of the surface as the water is pumped out of the reservoir. What you are looking at here is not just some beautiful example of physics-inspired computer graphics, but it is actual, highly resolved and highly accurate multi-phase physics, computed with the lattice Boltzmann code Palabos. Look at the small droplets that detach from the bulk in the upper parts of the simulation to appreciate at what high level of details the water-air interface is resolved. Also, consider the range of physical phenomena present in that example, including multi-phase flow in a water-air system wall structure interaction with the rotating geometry, fully resolved mechanisms of separating and merging droplets, fluid turbulence with under-resolved subgrade scale, and of course, gravity. To cope with the complexity of modern CFT, we need sophisticated tools, and one choice that has become more and more common is the lattice Boltzmann method. This talk is split into two parts. I will first walk you for a quarter hour or so through the theory of the lattice Boltzmann method, and then switch to a more fun part with four selected application examples of lattice Boltzmann. When I went to university, I did not learn about the lattice Boltzmann method at once. I was first taught about a very exotic and surprising numerical tool for simulating fluid flow, the so-called lattice gas automata, which are at the same time very similar and very different from lattice Boltzmann. Historically, Lattice Boltzmann evolved from these automata, and we will first have a look at them to get some background knowledge. The best known lattice gas model is called FHP. It tries to mimic the physics of a gas by forcing some idealized version of gas molecules to live on a discrete hexagonal grid. The molecules populate the nodes at grid intersections in a very simplistic way. Every single one of the six links connecting a node to one of its neighbors can be populated by a stateless particle traveling in the direction of this link. During one iteration of the numerical model, all molecules travel to one of the nearest neighbors, depending on the link on which they are situated. Then, collation takes place, during which the molecules on the node are reassigned to different links, depending on their initial configuration in the incoming state. Incredibly enough, this simplistic model is able to fully reproduce the physics of incompressible fluid flow, which means it is able to solve the Navier-Stokes equations if you use a sufficiently large amount of molecules. When it was developed in the early 1980s, this model met a huge enthusiasm and even made it to the front page of the Washington Post in November 1985. In that article, lattice gas automata were described as a revolutionary new approach to CFD which could have a crucial impact on the balance of technological knowledge in different parts of the world. But the enthusiasm was damped later on, when drawbacks of the method became apparent. For example, that this gas automata suffered from numerical noise, which means that you need to put a huge amount of molecules into the model in order to converge to an acceptable average. Also, typical computers turned out to be slow on discrete state calculations, and more efficient with floating point arithmetics. The lattice Boltzmann method, which then popped up, overcame these problems because it abandoned discrete molecular states in favor of a smooth description, based on the statistics of the gas molecules. In modern research, we use a framework called kinetic theory to derive and analyze lattice Boltzmann models. Here the microscopic state of the gas is described by a Newtonian model, which assigns a precise position and velocity to every single molecule. The molecules are frequently described as rigid spheres, which interact through fully elastic collisions. This is not a necessary restriction though, 
and it's also possible to describe non-ideal gases with a more sophisticated collision model. It's of course not possible to represent every single gas molecule in a computer simulation, because in a typical macroscopic gas volume we have around 10 to the power 23 molecules. Instead, Lattice Boltzmann describes the statistics of the gas through a quantity called velocity distribution function. This function describes the probability density for a gas molecule to be found at a given point in space with a given velocity. It depends on seven variables, three for the position x, three for the velocity xi, and one for time, and it is obviously a more complicated object than the ones we are used to in CFT. The velocity distribution function is linked in a very straightforward way to the macroscopic variables pressure, velocity, temperature, and so on. It's obvious that for the conversion of the distribution function into a macroscopic variable, we need to get rid of the velocity dependency, because the usual macroscopic variables depend only on position and time. To achieve this, we simply integrate away the velocity dependency. The macroscopic density of a gas, for example, is nothing else than a straightforward integral of the distribution function over the full velocity space. For the macroscopic flow velocity, the integral is weighted by the velocity of the molecules xi. In the language of statistics, one can say that the macroscopic velocity is the expected value of the velocities of the molecules. Temperature is the effect of the kinetic energy of the gas molecules. In an ideal gas, it is simply the expected value of the square molecular velocity. More generally, the stress tensor is a second-order velocity moment of the distribution function. Interestingly, the dependency on space position is not modified during the conversion of the distribution function into a macroscopic variable. This means that the velocity distribution function is a continuum variable in the traditional sense and it represents the flow at the same scale as traditional macroscopic numerical methods. This observation does away with one of the most common misconceptions of the lattice Boltzmann method, namely that this method is designed to solve microscopic physics. This is however not the case, or at least not necessarily. When lattice Boltzmann is called a microscopic or mesoscopic method, people refer to the theoretical background of the method and to the type of equations the method is able to solve, but not to the difference between a continuum method and a discrete particle approach. The space-time dynamics for the velocity distribution function is usually given by the so-called Boltzmann equation, like the Navier-Stokes equations, which are balance equations for the fluid momentum. The Boltzmann equation is a balance equation for particle densities. Imagine an infinitesimally small control volume. To increase the number of particles in that volume, a particle can either get into the volume by following a straight path through empty space, or it can be scattered into the volume as a consequence of pairwise particle collisions. The left-hand side term of the Boltzmann equation describes the free particle transport, and it is resolved by a Lagrangian derivative along a characteristic direction. The right-hand side term, the particle-particle collision, is more complicated and depends on the scattering cross-section of the molecules. To describe this term, you need to know how the momentum of a pair of molecules, depending on their initial configuration before collision, is impacted by a pairwise collision. Even for a simple hardball model with elastic collisions, this term is highly complicated, and you usually simplify it in order to recover the macroscopic physics you need at a low computational expense. The choice of the collision term is extremely important because it fully determines the content of the macroscopic physics the model produces. To discretize the distribution function in velocity space, it's natural to expand it in a truncated series, as it's frequently done in numerical analysis. We choose to perform this expansion in terms of Hermit polynomials, for which the mathematician Grad provided a theoretical framework back in the 1940s. There exists a compelling reason for the choice of the Hermit polynomials. As you carry out the expansion, the coefficients of the polynomials, labeled as a superscript n in this equation, are identical to the usual macroscopic variables. The order zero coefficient, for example, is nothing else than the fluid density at a given point in space and time. 
The next three coefficients, if we count them as scalar variables, have the same definition as the fluid momentum, and so on. As we have seen, an integral over velocity space must be computed for each coefficient of the Hermit tensor expansion, or macroscopic variable. This evaluation of integrals is one of the most critical aspects of the numerical lattice Boltzmann method. To approximate these integrals in a cheap way, we apply a technique known as Gaussian quadrature, which again is very standard in numerical analysis. The integral is replaced by a sum over a selected number of points, the Gaussian quadrature points. In our case, these points live in the space of velocities and therefore represent the family of discrete velocities. An interesting property of Gaussian quadrature is that it provides exact results for integrals applied to polynomials of a certain degree or less. Now, remember that we chose to approximate the distribution function by a polynomial as a result of the truncated expansion. We then end up with truncated populations f superscript n, which live in a Hilbert subspace of limited dimensionality for the velocities. In this subspace, the Gaussian quadratures are exactly identical to the integrals for all velocity moments up to a certain degree. As a consequence, which I don't prove but just motivate intuitively, the numerical model is able to simulate the physics linked to all macroscopic variables which at a given level are produced exactly by the quadrature rule. This means that we have a numerical model based on a truncated expansion with unusual properties, because taking the expansion to a higher order does not improve the rate of grid convergency, but instead adds new physics to the model. This is one of the reasons why Lattice Boltzmann is so successful for complex coupled problems. Adding new physics is as easy as fiddling with the details of particle-particle collision or adding an extra term to the Hermit tensor expansion. To conclude this crash course to kinetic theory, let me point out that the variables which we actually simulate in the Lattice Boltzmann simulation stand for the distribution function, evaluated at one of the discrete velocities. They are called particle populations and labeled as f subscript i, where i runs from 1 to the number of discrete velocities. In practice, the number of variables you need to allocate on every grid node corresponds to the number of quadrature points present in the gauss hermit quadrature rule. Let's now look at the type of physics you can simulate as you walk through increasingly high order terms of the Hermit tensor expansion. If you take the model to a level at which quadrature is exact for polynomials of degree 4, you recover the basic Navier-Stokes equations for incompressible and non-thermal flow. At this level, there exist Gaussian quadrature rules with 15, 19 or 27 quadrature points in 3D, and the lattice Boltzmann implementation therefore needs to allocate 15, 19 or 27 variables on every grid node. At a polynomial degree of 6 and with 39 quadrature points, the momentum equations for Navier-Stokes can be run in a supersonic regime, and you obtain the energy equations for Navier-Stokes for small temperature variations, and a small Mach number approximation of the Burnett slash Super Burnett equations. The Burnett equations describe the physics of a fluid at high Knudsen number, as for example a rarefied gas or a system in nanofluidics. These equations are usually very tough to solve, and it's amazing how easily they emerge in lattice Boltzmann theory. Finally, at a polynomial degree of 8 and with 121 quadrature points, it's possible to simulate the energy equation for Navier-Stokes and the momentum equations at Burnett level without any restrictions. An example is the widely used stencil with 19 quadrature points, for which the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations can be solved at low Mach number. In this case, the discrete velocities are shown on the picture on the right. The arrows represent at the same time the number of variables located on the grid node and the connectivity between the grid node and its neighbor. In summary, and we are now done with the overview of lattice Boltzmann theory, Let's use our improved understanding of Lattice Boltzmann to see which advantages this method offers over other approaches. First of all, the theoretical framework offered by Lattice Boltzmann is really hybrid in all its aspects. It inherits many of its properties from particle methods, because it is derived from the particle-based lattice gas automata. But then again, it is a mesh-based solver for the Boltzmann equation, 
and therefore a continuum method, and inherits many of its properties from conventional Eulerian flow solvers. Second advantage, that is Boltzmann incorporates complex physics in a very natural way, by playing with the details of particle-particle collision, or with the level of expansion of the distribution function in a velocity space. Complex physics can include multi-phase flow, thermal flow, liquid gas or solid-liquid phase transitions, or all of this at once. Finally, it is relatively easy to implement Lattice Boltzmann on complex hardware, like graphics cards, or on massively parallel computers, because the variables simulated in the code are directly interpreted in terms of particle motion in space. It's therefore natural to carry out the space decomposition of the allocated memory, and dispatch the pieces to many processor cores. To illustrate the point about computational efficiency, let me show you a benchmark curve for the open source lattice Boltzmann called Palabos, which we used to simulate blood flow inside a section of a human artery. We ran the benchmark case on a BlueGene P supercomputer with 16,000 CPU cores, and we executed exactly the same problem with the same resolution, using first all the 16,000 CPU cores available to us, and then using just a subset of these cores. We were able to play this game down to a configuration of 128 cores before running out of memory. Now 16,000 is equal to 128 squared, roughly speaking. And what that means is that we can run exactly the same problem on two machines, one of which is 128 times more powerful than the other one. In an ideal world, the code would run 128 times faster on the powerful machine. And we got close to that with a performance loss of just 30%. In the language of parallel computing, people call this a strong scaling, because we are making a strong point accelerating problems of typical size with the help of supercomputers, and not just using parallel computers for huge simulations of interest in fundamental science. In Lattice Boltzmann, this type of strong scaling is obtained for problems with any type of complex geometry, like a fully resolved porous media and for any type of complex flows, including multi-phase flows, or flows with thermal effects and chemical reactions. Talking about parallel computing, the field of CFT suffers a lot from what is known as the pre-processing bottleneck, which means that, while many CFT codes are fully parallel, they are executed on datasets which need to be pre-processed first, with non-parallel or weakly parallel algorithms. The computational mesh is, for example, frequently computed with an external mesh generator, which, unlike the actual CFT solver, cannot run on thousands of cores. In the best case, you spend more time setting up the problem than running the solver, and in the worst case, the mesh generator runs out of memory and aborts. In contrast, Lattice Boltzmann codes like Palabos are shipped all-inclusive, and offer fully parallel algorithms for pre- and post-processing. This graph here, for example, refers to the benchmark case of the previous slide, the one about blood flow in a human artery, and it shows how the mesh generator included in Palabos scales on the 16,000 core blue gene. The curve shows how a huge computational mesh with half a billion grid nodes is generated in just four and a half minutes. This is completely negligible compared to the typical execution time of many hours for the fluid solver. In practice, this means that mesh generation is a quasi-instantaneous process in Lattice Boltzmann. To understand why, you must know that we don't pre-compute body-fitted meshes to match the boundaries of complex geometries. Instead, Lattice Boltzmann uses a homogeneous grid and handles the data transfer between the grid and the curved boundary of the geometry during runtime, with appropriate interpolations. Lattice Boltzmann codes are frequently implemented not only on parallel computers, but on complex hardware in general, and graphics cards in particular have become one of the favorite playgrounds of Lattice Boltzmann hackers. On a graphics processing unit or GPU, you often reach the same performance as on a conventional CPU, at a lower financial cost and at a lower energy consumption. The drawback is the increased difficulty in programming such a piece of hardware, and as a result, the longer development cycles. This is a tough drawback in a field as dynamic as Lattice Boltzmann, in which many new models pop up every year, and keeping up the pace with a software implementation is a huge challenge. Anyway, 
Let's compare the simulation speed of a lattice wall sound code on the CPU with the execution speed on the GPU. For the CPU, we use the Palabos software and one of the fastest Intel Sandy Bridge 8 core processors. And for the GPU, we took the results of the open source Lattice Boltzmann library Sailfish, executed on an NVIDIA Tesla C2050. The benchmark case is a simple incompressible flow in a cubic domain. In real life problems with more physics or complex geometries, benchmark results are of course different. But this simple comparison provides a baseline for the CPU GPU comparison. In this case, the GPU is more than three times faster than the CPU. A factor 3 is of course not an order of magnitude, and the conclusion is that the GPU is not a game changer. It does provide a nice speed up though, and the whole question is how to take advantage of this without ending up with a too massive pile of code that is tied to a specific proprietary hardware platform. The path we adopt in Palabos, and which I believe offers an answer to these question marks, is a hybrid one, in which a CFT problem is spatially decomposed into pieces which, depending on their content, are dispatched either to the CPU or to a GPU or to any other type of hardware accelerator. And this, finally, ends the theory section of my talk. In the second part, we look at four typical Lattice Boltzmann simulations, which were all carried out with the Palabos library. For the first example, imagine that you enter a hot conference room and try to cool it down as fast as possible. The air conditioner consists of a fan, which is mounted on the wall close to the ceiling. It can operate in two ways, either by injecting the cold air at a constant rigid angle, as shown on the left image, or by sweeping up and down, as on the right image. We ran both cases as full 3D simulations, which spanned the whole space of the conference room although for the sake of clarity we display the results on a 2D slice only. What's appealing in the simulation results is the high level of details which is apparent in the flow pattern, and which is pretty unusual in the field of CFD. At the outlet of the steady fan, you recognize for example the typical structure of a kelvin helmholtz instability, which is due to the large velocity difference between the hot and the cold fluid layer. The purpose of such a simulation is, for example, to find out how much time it takes for the air conditioner to cool down the room in either case. The sweeping fan is of course more efficient, because it also cools down areas which the steady diffuser cannot reach. In order to be more quantitative and reach grid convergency, we observed however that it is necessary to go down to the level of resolution shown in this animation, because all these small patterns have a quantitative influence on the flow evolution. It was not possible to reproduce the same data on a coarser grid using some continuum model for the subgrid scales. Like many other examples, this simulation shows that high resolution matters. You can obtain better quantitative insight into a problem with the help of Lattice Boltzmann through a brute force approach, like in the present example, in which we use the mesh with over a billion grid points. In the next example, we see the results of a blood flow simulation in a human artery. The balloon-like bulge on top of the artery, called aneurysm, is often caused by disease, and it carries a significant risk of rupture. It can, however, happen that blood clotting occurs in the aneurysm, a phenomenon that tends to stabilize the aneurysm and decrease the risk of rupture. You need to simulate red blood cells in order to reproduce blood clotting from first principles. They are injected into the simulation as Lagrangian particles, which move independently of the Eulerian lattice Boltzmann mesh. The red color visible on the animation represents the density of red blood cells. When blood clotting occurs, the red blood cells stick to the artery wall and change the shape of the geometry as an effect of liquid-solid phase transition. Blood clotting is of course a phenomenon that happens on a much larger timescale than the pulsations of a heartbeat. In this simulation they are put on a common scale with help of a multi-scale simulation technique. What's important to understand in this example is that the hybrid nature of Lattice Boltzmann makes it easy to fully couple a discrete particle method with a grid-based solver and to integrate complicated phenomena like liquid-solid phase transitions on top of all of this. In the third example, 
we turn to a coupled two-phase system, a domain for which Lattice Boltzmann is probably best known. The simulation reproduces a swirl atomizer in which a fluid is subject to a rotational motion and is projected into an air-filled chamber. The liquid develops a hollow air core and propagates as a thin conical sheet which is unstable and breaks up into ligaments and droplets. A colored ring is superimposed to the image to tag the droplets which have separated from the bulk of the fluid. The size of the droplet is shown both by the radius and the color of the ring. In an actual simulation, the recognition and classification of droplets is performed at every time step and is used to model additional subgrid scale physics. Although in this simulation we used a very high resolution to fully resolve the conical sheet and the primary breakup of the sheet into droplets, this resolution is still insufficient to cope with secondary breakup into even smaller droplets. The recognition of droplets is required at this stage to predict the onset of secondary breakup after which the smallest droplets are represented by Lagrangian particles. In the fourth and final example, we turn to the field of turbulence modeling with Lattice Boltzmann and start again with a bit of theory. Most turbulence models in Lattice Boltzmann are based on large eddy simulations, or LES. Lattice Boltzmann solvers are fundamentally time dependent. You can, of course, solve for a stationary state and there exist even techniques to accelerate the convergence to that steady state. But at a basic theoretical level, Lattice Boltzmann remains a method for time-dependent flows. The choice of LES for turbulence modeling is therefore very natural. To obtain such a model, you proceed in a standard way. Take the basic equation, in our case that's the Boltzmann equation, and apply a filter. The result is again a Boltzmann equation but with a modified collision term, which depends on unknown subgrid variables. The purpose of a turbulence model, then, is to find a closure scheme for these under-resolved scales. It has recently been shown that approximated deconvolution models, or ADM, which are also used in other fields of CFD, provide highly efficient subgrid models for Lattice Boltzmann. These ADM models are not simply based on the assumption of turbulent viscosity, but instead they add some dissipation to the simulation through selective spatial filtering. We now apply ADM filtering to a standard benchmark case, a turbulent flow between parallel plates. The results are shown in the animation in which the color stands for the flow velocity. The fluid is contained between two no-slip walls on the top and bottom and is translated with a constant mean flow. Additionally to ADM, this simulation includes a boundary layer model on the walls, which requires at every time step the resolution of an ordinary differential equation on every node which is neighboring a wall. To verify how accurate the model is, the numerical results were compared against reference solutions from direct numerical simulations with the spectral method. The dashed line shows the average velocity at a certain distance from the wall for the reference solution, and the dots come from the under-resolved that is Boltzmann simulation. In this first graph, the lattice Boltzmann simulation was under-resolved by a factor 200 in every space direction. And yet, the results match those from the DNS extremely well, even far from the wall. As a next step, the lattice Boltzmann simulation is under-resolved by a factor 1000 in every space direction, which means that it uses a billion times less grid nodes than a corresponding fully resolved simulation. In this case, the match with the direct numerical simulation is not perfect any longer, but the results remain very close to the reference solution. This is an amazing result, which is barely reached with other LES tools, and it shows how naturally you can incorporate turbulence models in Lattice Boltzmann. With this, my talk comes to an end, and we can now reach a conclusion. I provided you with a brief overview of the Lattice Boltzmann method, and showed that it has two origins, one from the particle-based lattice gas automata and one as a continuum solver for the Boltzmann equation. Through a selection of examples, we saw that this method has compelling advantages. In particular, it runs very fast on simple computers, on parallel clusters, and on massively parallel supercomputers. It comes all-inclusive and includes parallel algorithms for the pre- and post-processing of data. It can reach very high resolution and fully resolve problems with small structures. It couples and combines complex physical phenomena and results in a fully integrated solver for all these ingredients at the same time. And finally, 
It offers state-of-the-art models like LES for turbulence modeling and algorithms like droplet matching and breakup modeling, which are all fully parallel. If you'd like to learn more about the Lattice Boltzmann method, you can visit the webpage of the Palabos project. From there, you can download the open source flow solver, but you will also find some documentation and other resources around the Lattice Boltzmann method. The website offers in particular a list of masters and PhD theses, which you can read to learn more about a specific topic in this field. A forum is also available on which you can ask questions or participate in conversations about the Lattice Boltzmann method. Now, although I only found the time to show you the results of four Lattice Boltzmann simulations, you will find many more of them published on the internet. There's for example a page which aggregates several industrial applications on multi-phase flow. Another page focuses on static fluid mixers and on the computation of the mixing quality. Many other, more academically oriented examples can finally be found directly on the Palabas webpage. To end with, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to this talk. Dimitrios Kontaksakis from the Flowkit company in Switzerland is one of the main authors of the multi-phase module in Palavos, and he executed the simulations of the pump and of the atomizer in this talk. Orestes Malaspinas from the University of Geneva in Switzerland and from the University Pierre et Marie Curie in Paris, France, is one of the main authors of ADM implementations in Lattice Boltzmann, and he produced the simulations of blood clotting in an artery and of a turbulent flow between plates. Andrea Parmigiani from Georgia Tech in the US made crucial contributions to the multi-phase models and applications in Lattice Boltzmann. Bastien Champard from the University of Geneva in Switzerland made fundamental theoretical contributions to the field of Lattice Boltzmann, and he provided the slide on cellular automata in this talk. Michał Januszewski from Google in Switzerland is the leader of the GPU project Sailfish. He provided data and insights for the CPU-GPU comparison in this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed learning more about the Lattice Boltzmann method today.